there's no point. What, sorry, what was that, Dave? Have you heard anything from Joel? No. I just wondered. Um, all right, so this week's Torah portion is the last one in the book of Genesis. Um, and so Jacob is dying. Um, he calls in all of his children. He blesses them one by one and gives them, I, I mean, some of these blessings don't feel very blessing-y. Um, but he gives them their sort of inheritance, their spiritual inheritance, I guess, based on their behaviors um, in life. And, um, and that sort of those things become like the symbols of the tribes later. Um, but before he calls in all of his own sons and does that, first he calls in Joseph and his Joseph's two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim are the only two grandchildren, as far as we know, that get blessings. Um, and, and um, you know, inheritances, so to speak, directly from Jacob. So Joseph is, um, essentially gets a double portion because his sons each get a, a portion. Um, and uh, when Joseph puts, brings his children in, Jacob puts the right hand on the younger child and the left hand on the older child. And Joseph says like, no, you've, you've done it incorrectly and tries to switch the hands back. And Jacob insists like, even though he's going blind and he's on his deathbed and he's maybe not, 100% with it still, he says, no, no, I know what I'm doing. And he puts his hands back and gives um, the, sorry, my phone is ringing, um, gives that more prestigious blessing to Ephraim the younger. Um, and yeah, so that's the whole, the summary is pretty simple because it's the blessings for this sons, but we can certainly get into some depth um, with each of the 12 sons, um, or the, I guess, 13 blessings, in, you know, including the two grandsons. Um, but yeah, I don't know, where do you, who, does anything jump out at any of you, or do you want to start? I'm talking about the two grandsons, and he yeah. makes a point of saying that Ephraim is going, I mean, it sounds like a repeat of the blessings that he had done to his children, but is there any indication that Ephraim has Ephraim's um, um, no. progeny get more anything than? Oh, later? Yeah. Um, I thought you were asking if there's any indication that Ephraim is more deserving. Um, yeah. Because it says that he's going, to, I mean, he says, no, I'm doing it the way I want to do because, um, because um, Ephraim will be greater than his brother and his offspring. So did he, did he show any signs of being greater or his offspring being um, Was that forgotten? It's not, it's not forgotten necessarily, but it's not. Um, it doesn't loom very large. So um, through, from the tribe of Ephraim comes Joshua um, and then the judge Gideon um, who comes just before Samson. Uh, so there are like other, but I'm sure if we really combed the pro, you know the prophets and the writings we would find more connections to Manasseh too like every tribe had a important descendant um so I'm not I'm not really sure it would be interesting to look 
um, to do like a, a search for Ephraim's name and see where else it comes up. Um, it does come up a lot in the prophets in the like, um, not, not just the book of prophets, like judges is from the Nach section of Tanakh, but like, um, in the prophetic poetry, there's a lot of places where Ephraim is used as a euphemism for Israel. So I guess that's a callback to it, but he didn't get, his tribe didn't necessarily get more land or like special roles, I don't know. Well, no, but but if, if Joshua was was from him, then obviously that's that that's something. Yeah. I always found it striking that Jake that Joseph um, tries to correct his father at all, knowing the rest of their family history. Like, who are you to say that the younger shouldn't get the the bigger portion? <laughs> You, you're the only one bringing in grandchildren at all to get blessings and you're not the oldest like you know yeah Dave this is just a, a minor little thing but right near the top, beginning of the re reading he says um, when Joseph said, do me this favor, place your hand under my thigh as a pledge of your steadfast loyalty. That seemed a very odd request. I didn't understand why putting a hand under a thigh is a pledge of loyalty. Um, that's just a common thing in that time. You know, it's a place of vulnerability and intimacy so to that's like it's a step up from handshake um you know to place your thigh under there i mean to place your hand under there to to have someone place their hand there you know was a symbol of trust and like so this is how we're establishing this oath i think last week i compared it to like the the spit shake you know yeah <laughs> just kind of ups the ante a little bit. Um, but yeah, we, we see it like uh, Abraham does it with Eliezer before he goes off to find Isaac's bride and things like that. We see it in other places in the Tanakh. I think maybe the, um, the Torah's emphasis on it here is to draw attention to the fact that maybe he doesn't like super believe that Joseph will do it on his own or like without a oath like that, that if he just tells Joseph that that's what he wants sort of casually, then Joseph might not do it, that Joseph has become very Egyptianized and very settled in, um, in Egypt and he won't take Jacob's body back to the land of Canaan and give him a proper Israelite. I mean, what does that mean? There's three generations, but you know, it won't won't bury them in won't bury him in Machpelah. He even says, "Please." Yes. Seem like we see that much. Yes. Yeah, in Hebrew, that the word "na." is um it's a it's it's not just please like a general term of manners the way we would say you know in modern hebrew bavakasha is please you know in a sort of um like formal, I guess, like not necessarily sincere, but like this is just how we speak to each other in polite company. But na in biblical Hebrew is like really this term of pleading and um, intense 
you know, request. Are your birds acting up? Uh, we're taking care of my mother's parakeet. She's something like that. Oh, okay. She's about to knock stuff off a shelf, I think. She's pushing on some little figurines with a ladder. Uh -huh. Why there's a ladder there, a little bird ladder. <laughs> wow. Dave, how about you? Um, <clears throat> I was I was pretty much taken aback by the blessings. Uh, um, I mean, I I wasn't clear that this happened one by one. That each person came into the tent alone with Jacob and was given his blessing. I I had the impression that it was all of the brothers were there and they were all hearing this message, the messages that each one got, that it was not a uh, mm. private one-on-one -on -one session. And I thought to say what he said to Reuben, even though it's true, um, was really, you know, would you really say that in front of all your kids? Reuben, you slept with my concubine you're a so-and-so, would you really call Zebulon, well, I think it was Zebulon, an, a wild ass? Would yeah. You, would you say, would you call out Dan in front of everybody and say, oh, by the way, you're a snake in the grass, you know, your way of uh, of coping with adversity is to um, uh, let your enemy pass by and then bite him in the heel and poison him. I'm, I'm just, you know, as I looked at them, I thought the only one, I mean, if I were looking to pass on the reins of the of the clan to someone, and I didn't want the first one, Reuben, to get it, where would I look? I'd look at Joseph. I mean, mm -hmm. this is the number two man in Egypt, the man who has prevented the entire population, not only of Egypt, but of all the surrounding areas they could get there from starving to death, who has obviously been blessed with the same type of visions that, that Jacob has, why not pick him? But no, he picks Judah who ends up sleeping with his daughter-in-law. And I'm thinking, mm, I just, uh, this doesn't, I, I was just unsettled by it all. And I knew about it, you know, kind of vaguely or, uh, from previous years, but I have certainly not glanced at it since last year. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't even remember when I read them over and I said, really? Really? You said that? And yeah. So I was, as I said, unsettled, taken aback. And part of me tried to cling to one phrase where it says, um, prior to giving the blessings, he, it says something about, uh, let me call that up. Uh, in the text or in one of the commentaries? Yeah. Come together to the, this is okay. um, uh, 49 verse one. Jacob called his sons and said, come together that I may tell you what is to befall you in days to come. And so at that point, I was wondering, was this just like J Jacob prophesying? I mean, yeah, he's 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 putting the the steel to a number of them, but is this like his prophecy for them? Yes. So Ibn Ezra says that these are prophecies, um, and that it, so it says, um, you know, Jacob called to all his sons, "Come together, that I may tell you what is to befall you in days to come." And then at the end of all of that, of, of all of the weird comments about his um uh children there is some place where it also says oh it's not there at the end um where it does use the word blessing specifically it's not actually there at the end of that chapter like i thought it said it says instructions here um but somewhere it says blessings and ibn ezra says 
uh, that Jacob did say nicer things, that there were actually blessings. And then they concluded with these prophecies and scripture for whatever reason decided not to share the blessings with us. Oh. Just like a pretty big okay, okay. omission. Um, Rashi says that uh, Jacob intended to give them, do it the other way around, that Jacob intended to give them these like harsh prophecies and then conclude with also the prophecy of the end of Israel's exile and blessings, like start with the hard stuff and end with positive stuff. But then the spirit of Shekhinah left him and he like got distracted by the harsh things and like forgot to, to conclude with the positive stuff. So I like both of those <laughs> readings. I think that that's, Ibn Ezra is very, um, I mean, that one's like a little hard to swallow. Like that's very Ibn Ezra to me of like, clearly this thing that's terrible was on purpose and is a, you know, it's about the, Trans the meaning of how things are transcribed, that every brush stroke of the calligraphy in the Torah has a meaning. And like there was a reason for leaving out these words entirely, but we know they were there. That's like very Ibn Ezra. Um, Rashi's like is a little bit more, I like that there's more sort of like Midrash. Uh, it feels there's more spirit to it, um, you know, that he's very ill and the spirit of Shekhinah kind of comes and goes within him and um, his grasp on what he's actually saying and on life kind of comes and goes. So he starts with this grand intent of sharing the harsh prophecy and segueing into a blessing at the end, but then he forgets or the spirit of Shekhinah leaves him and oops. Joseph does get blessings. Joseph um, does. Um, but but Joseph, see, I mean, he they're in the room first, and then it says Jacob called all his sons. Um, no, no, no. But it, it, at the end of the list of. Um, at the end of all the oh oh yeah 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 that too in this section Joseph does get blessings in the end yes although Joseph is also compared to a, a wild ass but maybe a wild ass doesn't have the same connotation back then that it does now um I mean it's probably not a synonym the way it is in English right. Um, because he says a wild ass by a spring with wild colts on a hillside. That's kind of, it's, it's kind of an attractive picture in a way. Yeah. He goes also on. The, to, sorry, go ahead. Should I who blesses you with the blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep, the couches below, blessings of the breast and the womb. I mean, you can't ask for more than that. And mm -hmm. Joseph gets them all. And then Benjamin, who was supposed to be a favorite, just as a ravenous wolf. And I don't know what where that came from. Um, because he is mighty. Uh, and the men of Gabia are proof of this. The tribe of Benjamin kind of starts the like final war. Oh, I knocked my heater over. Um, the tribe of Benjamin st starts that final war in the book of Judges before um, the king, before Saul becomes king. Um, so I guess, I think it's meant to be a prophecy for that, but I guess it doesn't really, I mean, a lot of these, well, it's sort of mixed, right? Because we don't, we don't get a lot of personality for like at least half the brothers. So Naphtali is a hind let loose, which yields lovely fawns. That's kind of a positive one, but I have no idea what it means. We've, we don't know anything about Naphtali, you know? Um, like most of these, we know, we know sort of what happened with Levi and Simon. 
Um, With why, Judah. What? With and Judah. Judah and Reuben. Those are like the four that we really have any context for. Even Benjamin, we don't know anything about what he's like done personally. We just know that he's the youngest and maybe the favorite. It's a little unclear to me if he um, supplants Joseph as the favorite because now he's the youngest or because Joseph is presumed to be dead. And so once the family moves to Egypt and has Joseph back, you know, what that does to Benjamin's relationship with his father or his father's relationship to him, because I'm not really sure how reciprocal any of these relationships are with Jacob. Um, but, but yeah, either way, we don't, he do, yeah, we don't get a lot of personality about them. So we it's other than knowing Right. So they be the, in that light, I guess it's more clear how these are prophecies rather than blessings. That these really aren't about these men or sons of Jacob. It's about how these tribes will be viewed and treated after the Exodus. But it, they are kind of framed as blessings or that as though they have anything to do with the men themselves when that only feels relevant for four of them. And then Levi, who is the start of the, the priestly tribe, his weapons are tools of lawlessness and it just doesn't follow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Sometimes it's explained that Levi doesn't get a portion, right? It says, I will divide them in Jacob, um, that they don't get their own land because of the violence in Shechem, because Levi and Simon were the, um, at, at least the leaders of that massacre. Um, but then, a, Simon still gets a portion of land, and B, or the, the tribe of Simon, and B, um, Levi, like, Levi gets this other grand status, you know, okay, they don't have a, a portion of land, they don't have, like, a central area that belongs to the Levites, like, Jerusalem is not doesn't belong to them it belongs to everybody they just have to live there but they're also pretty centralized there like they they don't really scatter to the winds they live in the temple or around the you know on the temple mount um so it doesn't really follow i mean it's sort of like it follows that okay so because they are punished because they are weapons, tools of lawlessness, blah, 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 that they don't get a portion of land. And then we see that they don't get a portion of land. But then the way that they are treated in where they do live, like is still pretty exalted. Um, yeah, I don't know. And it doesn't, it doesn't work as well for Levi as for Simon either. The difference in how they are remembered. Rashi says, all the scribes and elementary teachers were of the tribe of Simon. Thus, the tribe was dispersed, even if they had like a, a an area of Israel that was theirs to go back to. They ended up having to travel throughout the land to, to seek posts as teachers. I don't know if that's actually written 
like if we have any real context for that or if that's what Rashi decided. Oh, it's from Genesis Rabbah. That's where he got that from. Which, so maybe in the time of the Talmud and that Midrash, maybe there were sages and scribes and teachers who could, you know, who did identify as from the tribe of Simon. And that's where that came from. I don't know. Interesting that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler, the ruler's staff from between his feet. But the first, no, yeah, but the, the, the kingly line doesn't actually come from Judah. I guess the one that persists does, but I don't think King David was a Judahite. Oh, he was. So Saul was from Benjamin. Oh, I didn't know that. One of them was definitely from Benjamin. And there's a comment about how it's like, it's the smallest tribe. How did this, how did like they get to have the king? I remember we covered that when we covered that, but I don't remember. Yeah. It's too many names, you know, it gets. <laughs> how Saul got chosen by hmm. this is sort of an aside but when I was reading in um, the very beginning and it then Jacob's name becomes Jacob Israel Jacob Israel when right. We, when we list the um, our forefathers in any of the in any of the prayers where we list them, he's always listed as Jacob. That's true. But Abraham is always Abraham and not Abram. Abram. I don't have an answer for that. In the prophets, it's often Israel. Not always, but often. Um, I guess Matovu could maybe be seen as, you know, how lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. It's a little unclear in the, like, in the story of Balaam where that comes from. If he is saying those repetitiously, like as the, tribes of this person like descended from Jacob slash Israel or I mean at that point they are a whole nation basically it's, they're in the desert but they are the people of Israel so um well, maybe that's why because it's clear when you say Jacob that you mean right the man as opposed to the right the tribe or whatever Makes sense. Right. Yeah, I guess that it does. That would confuse things. When we do the names of the patriarchs, we always call them Jacob, but there are so many times where we use Israel in other euphemistic ways that don't necessarily mean the land. Or sometimes it does mean the land, but not the country. And sometimes it means the nationhood and not the land and um you know like even the morning blessings I know we don't we don't have morning services that often but you know where there's two of them that gird Israel with strength and that crowns Israel with glory and 
what that means is the Jewish people doesn't, you know, actually refer to Israel, the, the person or the land or the country or whatever, but, you know, there's so many, so many ways to use that word. So I guess it helps to have a, at least that one step of clarity when we're talking about Jacob. So in the blessing for Joseph, I'm just looking, it just caught my eye right now, noticing, um, I guess it caught my eye because I noticed that there's a footnote that says the meaning of the Hebrew is uncertain, which then made me want to look at what the Hebrew says and why is it not clear. But um, verse 26, the blessings of your father surpass the blessings of my ancestors. To the utmost bounds of the eternal hills, may they rest on the head of Joseph on the brow of the elect of his brothers. Now, like there's there's kind of a lot there. So first of all, what does that mean? The blessings of your father surpass the blessings of my ancestors. Like aren't aren't his ancestors also Joseph's ancestor? Like he is his father. Is he just saying like I have been blessed more than my fathers, and so will you be blessed more than I was? And like maybe it's a statement of that. But the phrasing is kind of strange. And in the English, or sorry, in the Hebrew itself, birchot um, avicha, the blessings of your fathers, is a pretty direct translation. But but often avicha or or avi, like Abba, that that term for father, means ancestors or parents. Like it can be assertive. It's a masculine term, but you know, in Hebrew, like anything with mixed gender defaults to the masculine term term. And so it can mean a pretty broad understanding of my fathers, my forefathers, my whatever. Um, but then uh, it is greater than al birchot horai, my parents. I mean, horim is the modern Hebrew term for the set of parents, like mother and father. And so, and I don't, I can't think of a lot of other places that we see that in the Tanakh, because as I said, often just like father is sort of the stand-in term. Um, so that's, I don't know, that strikes me as meaningful, but I'm not sure what the meaning is. Um, I don't know if anyone else has speculation on that. It, when I read it, if I thought about it at all, it just sounded like, Joseph, this blessing that I'm giving you, I, your father, is, is even so much more than what I got from my father. Mm. Um, which, maybe because he's giving it honestly, I don't know. But I didn't know that about the, the couple, about the parents thing. So that's interesting. Yeah. And then again, looking at this, Benjamin is such an afterthought. I mean, everybody <laughs> else gets whole paragraphs and he gets three lines. Well, a lot of the middle brothers also only get two lines. Gad, Asher, and Naphtali each get, get one verse. Yeah, royal dainties, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, he shall yield royal dainties. Well, that's why they, isn't there a candy company called uh, Asher's? <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, the, you know, his bread is rich and he shall yield royal dainties. The sweets. Um, I don't know. <laughs> That's all I got. The, the food that will come from the territory of Asher will be fat. For there will be numerous olive trees in his territory so that it will flow like oil, flow with oil like a fountain. This is from Rashi. Um, Moses, is, Moses, blesses his, bleh, Moses blessed him in a like manner in Deuteronomy 28. Um, well, blessed his tribe, I guess. And Asher will dip his foot in oil. There we go. It's actually a pretty good blessing. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, in uh, 49 verse 18, right after he's described, Dan shall be a serpent by the road, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heel so that his rider is thrown backward. The next line doesn't seem to have anything to do with that. I wait for your deliverance, O Lord. Um. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't see how that applies. Uh, okay, so I think, so on 18, Rashi says, he prophesied that the Philistines would put out Samson's eyes. And because in, in that, in the story of Samson, Samson says, um, I pray for your deliverance, O Lord. Like it's a very similar, Raising. So I want, is Samson from the tribe of, yes. Okay, so Samson comes from the tribe of Dan. So that I think at least that's the connection that the rabbis are saying that this is a direct, this okay. is about Samson um, coming from the right tribe of Dan. It is pretty abrupt. Yeah, that's I just didn't see a connection with Dan. Yeah. So it's just kind of prophetic of the future. And, and Joseph may be, if he's dying, maybe in and out of um, contact with what he's actually doing, or he may not be able to distinguish the future from the present. I, yes. So that's what, what several of the rabbis say. Ibn Ezra also says that it could be um, I don't really know that I understand what he's saying here, but when the serpent bites the horse's heel, it is afraid that the rider will smash its head with the sword. Hence the prophet prayed, I wait for thy salvation, O Lord. So the salvation there refers to Dan. The meaning of our verse is, I trust to God for God's salvation. It is also possible that the scripture employs a noun in place of an infinitive. That's very Ibn Ezra. Let's get grammarly on. I don't even know what that means. Um, <laughs> our verse should thus be rendered, I trust that God will save you. Ah, okay. So not me. You're not, you're to, like the English has you're capitalized, but it's not, I wait for God's deliverance, it's I wait for your deliverance from God, is how Ibn Ezra appears to be understanding it, or, or offering a potential. Again, so I like, the, I like the Rashi better. I like this sort of midrashic, prophetic um, idea than like this very grammar heavy, you know, the text is just unclear, but it's on purpose. But it really does kind of mean what it says it means. It's almost as if you were reading a, a script of a play and Joseph is saying all this and then he feels the death rattle and he goes, oh, I oh yeah, yeah, that could be too. And then he goes on feels better and can continue on with the rest of them. Yeah. 
I like that. I don't know, all of the, in one way or another, either through Samson or somehow uh, communicating that Jacob is worried about, about the snake. They all, they all do want to connect it pretty directly to the verse before it, but I kind of like the idea of like, he's still in his death throes and he, you know, that he has to have these like asides. David, you look like that did not satisfy your question though. Um. No, I'm I'm willing to 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 go with that. I, okay. I, think, um, uh, I like Rambam's uh, explanation. I didn't think to turn on the commentary earlier, and it's um, his. It it's like he's saying, "Okay, Dan, you're going to be defending uh, the Israelites." Um, in the future, and I, I'm praying to God that you will be successful. Uh -huh. And he also relates it to Samson. Right. So, yeah, it looks like um, there's a fairly clear consensus. Well, not there is some consensus with with Rashi and maybe others that say, okay, this is really related to the future. Uh, and certainly Jacob seems to have the gift of, of, um, of what do you call that? Prophecy. Prophecy, thank you. Yeah. I think so. I just, I just hadn't didn't have the context for it. And that's neat to have the literary tie-in between this and, and Samson and, and it's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, we don't think that much, or I don't at least, I don't think about once we get like past the Exodus, really, I don't think that much about which tribe our various heroes come from, except, you know, I guess the Levites maintain some, you know, specific uniqueness because they serve the temple and they don't have land and they have, you know, they're the first ones carried off in the exile and that kind of thing. So they're notable, but the others, I like, I don't think that much about which tribe Samson came from and all of that. So it's interesting that how how significant those ties are to this portion, and especially once you look at the commentaries. Yeah. Meanwhile, the but the Haftra doesn't talk about any of those those connections. It draws the connection to just sort of that deathbed monologue. Um, I learned a term for it when we were doing the apocrypha study, but now I forget what it was. But there's this is like a very common theme in ancient literature, besides in scripture and in the apocrypha, of like sort of ethical will style of like a father or a, a parent. Some there were even some, I guess, according to the essays I read about the apocrypha. Um, there's none in the Tanakh, but of women also giving this sort of a deathbed speech, but of these like passing on to their sons. So that's the connection to our Haftra. It comes from First Kings chapter two. Um, when David's life was drawing to a close, he instructed his son as follows. And then, you know. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so then it it's, um, it's a little less pro, prophetic, I guess, then um, I, I think I lost my spot. Where did it go? <laughs> Chapter two. Uh, 
uh, where did it go? I just lost my spot. Sorry. Okay, wait, there we go. Um, yeah, it's a little less pro prophetic, I find, than Jacob's, but similar in that, you know, he draws his favorite son close and gives him a blessing and a reminder and, uh, um, you know, the inheritance and all that, and then, and dies. And that there's a lot of names dropped. <laughs> but not necessarily of his other sons. Which is kind of sad, actually, when you think about it. Um, any last questions or comments? I obviously need to read that uh, Haftorah because just scanning it briefly, uh, David does not come out very well uh, at the end of it. No, David. As, as bloodthirsty saying, I, I, I was going to, um, I told this guy I wouldn't kill him, but you go ahead and kill him for me. Yeah. Uh, Do not, and not just kill him, but like, Make sure that he's uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, it's, do not let his white hair go down to, in Sheol, to Sheol in peace. It's harsh. Very. Um. Yeah. This is where I think it would be useful for me to have a list of all of the sons of Jacob and then who their tribe's descendants were throughout Jewish history uh, so that I could say, oh, okay, that's maybe why this is taking place. Or, or this is where that comes from. Yeah, that call, would be helpful. To call your kid a wild ass or a ravenous wolf or um, a viper, eh, not perhaps, um, what I'd be looking forward for from my father at, at his deathbed, though, as it happened, he was gone, and I never, uh, never got anything from him. At the end, so mm. makes makes me wonder what he, whether he would have been disappointed uh, in me and had things to say of that nature, or uh, or what he would have said. That's an interesting idea. Maybe I'll go and think about that. So, what would my father have said to me? Because at the time he died, I had just taken a job teaching special ed. Hmm. The year before that, I had been living at home because I'd gotten uh, separ I was separated from my first wife. And before that, I was an auto mechanic for four years, which certainly did not please him at all. Um, you know, this fine education he paid for squandered. Uh, mm. Would have been interesting to see what he might have said to me. <laughs> I, again, I don't think some of these things, I mean, yeah, today if we called somebody a viper, it's obviously, a, you know, not a compliment, but but he's saying that, that Dan would be defending the people and, and, and so he was good at he would be good at what he did, which was biting horses' heels. But I'm, I'm not sure that they are all put downs. I mean, yeah, in Reuben's case, for sure. Um, but, but and Simeon so, and Levi. I mean, he's pretty brutal to them. Yeah. And I and I'm not sure what to make of the one that he says you're going to live. By, I I want to say Zebulun, you're going to live by the 
by the uh, coast and your flank is on Sedan. I don't even know what that means. Sedan uh, is a place. But does that mean you're gonna have, be wealthy, a wealthy businessman, and you're gonna spread out all over the place? Or does it mean you're, um, you're not gonna do much and you're gonna rely on other people to support you? I, mean, I don't even understand what he was saying to Zebulon, if it was Zebulon, I don't remember anymore. Yeah, it's so it is Zebulon. Um, I think it just it just means he's gonna be a like a a port city, or his dwelling will be a his tribe's portion of the land will be a port city. So, um, you know, then the rabbis say that means like so that so his tribe became you know traders because they were traders with a D, not. Right. Dick Arnold. Um, so that's uh, Fort City, Sedan? Yeah. Oh, well, I think Sedan is on the other side. So, so right, your his land will be um, on the seashore and his flank shall rest on Sedan. Sedan is the um, other, I, I think it's a Canaanite territory. I don't know, it comes up. Um, so let's see, Sidon in the Bible comes up sometimes as like a place where there's not necessarily conflict, but like border disputes. Um, so I think it's telling us that that's like, that's the, the geographical range of the territory of Naphtali. Yeah. 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 So it's, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't, or sorry, not Naphtali, Zebulun. Um, I, it doesn't get tell us much. Like, it's not um, a moral or, um, you know, a positive or negative the way a lot of the others are. And we don't, like, again, Zebulun is, is one of the brothers that, like, doesn't really get any scenes. So we don't know if this has anything to do with his personality. Does he show a good mind for business that he should be on the port city and, and doing the trading with the other you know, neighboring peoples? Does he have an affinity for the water? Can he swim? Can he sail? We have no idea, but this is the prophecy. That's where his tribe is going to end up and what they will do. Well, I'm looking at uh, a map that says 12 tribes of Israel, approximate borders assigned during the conquest. And what strikes me, uh, I, I don't know how to send this to you, um, but Manasseh also has a section, East Manasseh, and they're yeah. the largest portions on the map. Only it looks like Judah has a larger portion, but a, the center of it is taken up by Simeon. And Ephraim has a fairly small portion, bigger than Dan, bigger than Zebulun, probably the same size as Asher and Naphtali and Reuben. Yeah, so there's a lot of these maps that aren't, that are very approximate, obviously. Here's one from, can I make this big and share my screen? If it's gonna load. Um, I don't know, it's not loading. Uh, but so Manasseh splits. I can't really explain why they get so much land, but they get two pieces because um, they, there was a disagreement right before they enter the land in like under the leadership of Joshua about there were Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben liked where they had been settling the last couple of weeks and they didn't want to cross the Jordan River. And um, Joshua said, well, you have to cross to fight with us because we're a 
we are a people and you're one of us and you have to help us conquer this land that God promised us. But if we are successful and we conquer all this land, you can go back and settle east of the Jordan River. Um, so they do that. And then Manasseh, the there are people in the tribe of Manasseh that are like, oh, well, now that we've been to this side, we also kind of like it over here. So they get two sections. I agree that like, there's not really any explanation for why they get so much land in two sections. Theoretically, each portion should be smaller because yeah, like they're not a bigger tribe or they're not, they don't need that much land. They just need two sections of land. Um, and like Gad and Reuben don't have that second argument. They agree they're going to stay on east of the Jordan River so they don't get a second portion of land. But like Reuben is a pretty small portion comparatively and then um and some of them like benjamin as i mentioned benjamin is known for being the the smallest tribe um like i think they have the fewest numbers so that's why they get the smallest portion some of it makes sense but some of it i think is very random the that judah gets the most land it has to do with them being the tribe of the you know of king david and the um conquests of you know david conquered a lot of territory and united the tribes into one like there's um a lot of the book of samuel is about the tribes like being pretty disparate like the so the book of judges is like these cycles of the tribes are interfighting, they are not following God's rules, whatever. Then God sends a hero or a judge, sends someone like Samson or Gideon to unite them. Oh, sorry, I skipped a step. There's there's um, dissolution among the tribes, so then that makes them vulnerable to attack. So the, Can the Canaanites, the Philistines, mostly it's the Philistines, but whoever, the Phoenician, somebody comes in and attacks, and then God sends a hero to save the Israelite people from attack. And then, and like that rallies them all together. And they put their support behind that hero for a while. Um, they ask Gideon to be king. And Gideon says, no. Um, and so then Gideon dies and there's like no heir to that hero-ness because he didn't accept the kingship. And so the people fall back into fight, infighting and dissolution and the cycle continues. So then under the king, they start to kind of, you know, under King Saul, they sort of start to, to come together as a people because they have a single human ruler. But there's still a lot of like, pockets of of non-israelite living between like amongst the tribes of israel and so there's huge sections of territory in these borders of biblical israel that are not really israelite controlled so a lot of david in the, the first part of the book of samuel besides besides being on the run from saul i mean that's the first impetus so he, he leaves shiloh or um you know wherever mount gilboa wherever saul's palace is i can't remember right now um that jacob the uh, david runs away from there because saul's trying to kill him but while he's running around the countryside evading saul he is conquering those pockets like wiping out not necessarily killing there's some portions where he's killing Philistines and Canaanites and whatever, but a lot of it's just like he's planting flags. Like it's it's just kind of, I'm marrying a woman from here and declaring that this is now part of my territory and shoring up more support from those more far-flung tribes that like were under Saul, but they, because they were further apart and there was all this non-Israelite land in between, they like, weren't really paying taxes or whatever, like they were disconnected, but David really reconnects all of them. So I think that's, I mean, that's the main reason that then 
the tribe of Judah gets to be so big because he conquered all that land. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't know. It, it's all sort of approximate because of, you know, they didn't have these maps back then. So these are drawn based on what scripture tells us. Scripture is not always clear um, on where the boundaries are. Um, and these aren't necessarily hard and fast borders, especially after, um, well, no, actually I take that back. Don't forget I said, especially. These are never hard and fast borders, that there was relationships between the tribes, there was semi-nomadic behavior still, they, they're shepherds, they have to go, like, they have to go where the grass is or whatever, like, it's not, um, it's not super established boundaries. But Zebulon is on the coast, sort of. Asha cuts in a little according to this map. These maps are not, not no two maps here look the same. <laughs> I shouldn't depend on them. Yeah. Um, anyway, but if you ever look at, um, like the next time we take the Taurus scroll out, take a good look at the breastplate um, or the, you know, the silver shield that comes from the breastplate of the, the priests that design. You'll see that each of the sort of like, they're almost like zodiac symbols, right? For each of the 12 tribes and, you know, one's a donkey and one's a snake and one's a lion. They are direct references to this portion. So there we go. Next week is our last, um Torah study for a while then there's some holidays that some people celebrate um and and then in January uh we're gonna I'm gonna I have to focus on the Sunday adult ed too so please join us for those January Sundays Jewish humor where did it come from what is it who knows let's find out okay, okay. bye everyone have a good week Thank you, Rabbi.